Welcome to Imagining Soviet Georgia. My name is Sopo Japharite. In today's episode, we have interviewed Keti Chukrov to discuss her book, Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism. We switch it up by not only having a guest on today's podcast, but also a guest co-host, Becca Natsrishuli. I love talking to Keti, not only because she's incredibly gracious and her book is thought-provoking, but also because I learned about myself. For those of you who don't know, I was born in Soviet Georgia, and then after the collapse and violence, especially the fear that my brother would be murdered, we left for the U.S. Fleeing to the U.S. saved my brother, but took my mother's life. This led me to explore sort of these ruptures and traumas in my life that have coincided with the ruptures and traumas in the post-Soviet world. My mother was the perfect embodiment of the Soviet woman. She was kind, generous, and always gave her things, or my things for that matter, away to anyone who wanted or needed it. She was a biologist and wholeheartedly believed in the importance and power of science. She held relationships in the highest regard, just as she did arts, literature, and the so-called high culture. She was a feminist without the label and an aggressive egalitarian. Yet she was just as charmed and taken back by commodities, consumer goods, as anyone else. I remember the way she showed me love was getting me things, especially if there were rare things like a Barbie. I think it was the version called Cindy from the dollar currency stores in Tbilisi. Though I only got to keep the Barbie or Cindy for one day, I had to, I had to lend it all to all my cousins. She got me dolls from Moscow, a banana-shaped fanny pack from Bulgaria, and so on. Every object had a story. She made believe that these objects were magical, and I would be magical for seeing or possessing them. When we moved to New York City, it was only a matter of time before these objects lost their magic. The things she possessed remained, but their context was gone. Everything that had given her life meaning in the Soviet Union and everything that fulfilled her, along with her ideals and values, was replaced by a life in the U.S. where she worked menial jobs after menial job just to keep the lights on. When I was a child, during one of our frequent talks about history, I had asked her why did the Soviet Union lose. She said it was because they had invested too much into the military at the expense of consumer goods. Her voice was full of regret. She realized how the idea of these consumer goods had possessed people in the Soviet Union, made them lose their minds and convinced certain parts of the population that there was something that was lacking. She was a Soviet woman who was loyal to internationalism. She was opposed to the nationalist fanaticism of the early 90s Georgia. And she was a believer in the universalist ideals. She realized she had been had. She never got to leave the U.S. alive, but she had packed her bags. This is why I appreciate Keti Chukrov's book, because it's so much more faithful to my mother's experience and to many other people like my mom's and their experience and also understanding the Soviet Union. While Marxists had been associated with the democratization process since the late 1800s in developed capitalist countries, the term social democracy was used to refer to them, Russian Empire revolutionaries or revolutionaries in the Russian Empire, they were also called social democrats themselves. But when they took power in 1917, they found themselves facing completely different challenges. Mainly, they had to build up the productive forces after the revolution. Therefore, the Soviet Union is often seen as an alternative model of development and industrialization, which many countries, like so-called third world countries, were locked out of Western capitalist development, and they wanted they could emulate the Soviet industrial model. So many different types of Marxists point to this and call this the state social state capitalism or state directed development. Not much different from capitalism. Indeed, many people today who have an affinity to a, 
to the Soviet Union are more or less statists and not so concerned with the emancipatory and democratic politics of Marxism. Often you will hear more about the Marxist political economy or economics of the Soviet Union than its relevance to Marxism. The failures of the Soviet Union are also framed solely in economic terms as capitalists and bourgeois economists repeat over and over again. Socialism doesn't work. While others deride the Soviet Union as something which was not real communism because it didn't meet certain emancipatory ideals. Keti's book, Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism, combines these two seemingly unrelated or even opposed interpretations of the Soviet Union. One focused on the so-called primacy of the hard economy and the emancipatory promise of communism. She locates emancipation within the failures of the efficient industrial economy. The inefficient production actually freed people from the liberal economy. It was actually communizing, so-called so communizing. Ketty also questions what emancipation really means. The leftist concepts that dominate in Western capitalist countries are not intrinsically emancipatory. So their entire framework or concepts may not be relevant to the way Soviet socialism was actually emancipatory. In fact, she reveals the hidden capitalist core in the very subjectivity of the anti-capitalist critique. So Keti will discuss her book with us and her ideas, how um, all the frameworks that we understand and the way we conceptualize Soviet Union and the way Western thinkers have conceptualized Soviet Union um, may not be in fact correct or, or helpful in understanding the Soviet Union. So in the tradition of reimagining Soviet Georgia, I would like to welcome Keti to our podcast. A little bit about Keti. Keti was born in Tbilisi, lived here until she was about 20, and le then left for Russia. She, what I know of that she speaks fluent Georgian, Russian, and English. She may also know more languages. She's a poet, an academic, art theorist, and philosopher. I'm very happy that she exists and hope more, more people in Georgia and everywhere else get to know her work. So here is our interview with Keti. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Keti, today. Uh, as you know, our project, Reimagining Soviet Georgia, uh, is attempting to... Um, not revised, but sort of rethink and reimagine ways that we can actually uh, understand the Soviet Union, especially, especially Soviet Georgia, um, and also sort of challenge ourselves in our, you know, not only the dominant understanding of Soviet Union, which is generally negative, um, but also challenge ourselves who, um, who we, some of us who don't have a negative understanding, but to really full, fully understand the Soviet Union. So your book, Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism, um, uh, reading it and also reading parts of it, the introduction sort of more, um, and then listening to you, seems like it fits in with what we are attempting to do. Um, and I just want to first ask, what does the title mean? And why did you decide to write this book? Well, the, the, the book starts with the political economy and uh, it um, tells uh, about uh, why something that is considered to be commonwealth in the socialist uh, conditions is considered to be extreme poverty for the capitalist subject. So we don't have the common cause for what is common good. Uh, because lots of um, theories of communization and which we have lots of theories of communization in the left theory, um, they tell us the idea of commons, but they somehow dispense with the idea of the good. The idea of the good is repressive. And you know, in psychoanalysis, good is also the repression of the state, the repression of sociality. So it is not only emancipatory, but rather repressive 
uh, category. Uh, and the idea of commons is associated with some kind of liberties and not at all with organizing the commonality of the good. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, uh, it was important for me to analyze this split on the one hand. On the other hand, um, the idea of um, uh, communist advancement is uh, associated with uh, wealth and associated with prosperity. Um, uh, with the welfare, with the politics of the welfare, uh, but it is also different from the idea of the social good and uh, the idea of um, communist uh, uh, basic need in economy. Uh, therefore, lots of leftist theoreticians uh, associate liberation with the so-called gender or social liberties or individual liberties uh, and the social advancement with technological advancement and common prosperity. For instance, even Yanis Varoufakis, you know, uh, the former uh, minister of economics of Greece, he talks that the new communism without communists would be when we can distribute between each other this surplus, surplus from Google, surplus from Facebook, all those new surpluses from digital economics, but nobody talks about the economics of basic need. So uh, uh, socialism uh, was somehow hated because it has this background of poverty. And I tried to analyze how this economics, which is deprived of surplus, uh, functions in its uh, sociality and what this sequestering and cutting of, of the surplus value, which is the um, uh, indispensable feature of a commodity, uh, how it tells on, uh, on economics and further on on sociality. One aspect of our project is viewing the bigger questions about the USSR through the Georgian experience and understanding the Georgian experience through a reassessment of the USSR. So given its internal national cultural diversity of the USSR and the ways that the civilizational paradigm of Soviet came to mean a multinational connectivity, how does this play into your understandings of epistemological and ontological difference of the Soviet Union? What can Georgia tell us about your questions, research, and conclusions? Well, Soviet Georgia, it's the, uh, it's the title of your whole initiative. And, and uh, frankly, when I learned uh, that such an initiative exists, I was uh, very much, uh, I, I was even astonished because I cannot imagine in the context of contemporary Georgia, such an organization and that you, you exist and nobody is arresting you uh, for, <laughs> for, uh, for discussing such issues. They discredit you here. They just discredit you and say you're a Russian agent. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I totally, I, I can imagine because I follow Georgian media and I know the context of governmental forces and of opposition, etc. I, I can imagine it very well. And I have friends uh, who would think that writing about Marx is not comme il faut and it's, it's really very shameful. So I, I can imagine all this, but I think uh, uh, Georgia is, as well as other post-Soviet uh, states like Ukraine, for instance, they are in the context of decommunization. Because what happened in Georgia is that uh, the idea of the Russian uh, imperialism and Soviet past was identified. And, and this is extremely wrong uh, uh, because I happen to um, face this even in Ukraine. I've been uh, in Ukraine many times and my um, friends and comrades, they are all leftist, but they hate talking about Soviet context because their idea is that there is leftist ideas, but Soviet Union has nothing to do with it. This is how they try to solve this problem. In Georgia, even this is not possible. 
So in Georgia, even this does not exist because there is no leftist politics. And those few people like Georgi Maisuradze who talk about leftist values, they come from more or less liberal context. And they became a little bit leftist in the last three or four years because uh, uh, the neoliberal uh, pressure is unbearable nowadays. But what is important uh, in, for Georgia, I think, is to differentiate the Russian grip and the Russian imperialist uh, history and the idea of the Sovietization and the socialist background, and even to somehow make differentiation within Soviet Union from geopolitical aspirations of Russia, which existed definitely, but at the same time from the socialist project, which is also very important, because when you erase completely socialist project, you erase the opportunity and potentiality for Georgia for precisely this, um, uh, um, for precisely the projects of emancipation. Why? Because uh, people talk about Western values. This exists only in Georgia. There is nothing like this. If you go to London or if you go to the United States or if you go to any emancipation-based theory in the West, talking about Western values means that you are West Eurocentric and that means that you are against post-colonial critique or you are against all that self-critique of the West, which had been happening for the last 50 years. So, so nobody would understand what you are talking about. Western values exist only in some kind of official macro-political discourse of the so-called, I don't know, uh, G8 uh, and the general official discourse. But this... Uh, means nothing for the social work, and this means nothing for the horizontal social uh, acquisition of uh, potentialities, cultural, political, and uh, I don't know, emancipatory. So I, I think Georgia is in this kind of aberration. Uh, and uh, then what pops up is the nationalist liberation, church, um, and some kind of uh, uh, ideology of uh, Western liberties, but these ideal Western liberties do not exist. Uh, uh, when I was in Ukraine and when the Maidan happened, my friends were talking, we Ukrainians, we shall teach Europe how to be Europe. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Europe is not considering Ukraine to be European and this belief that we are Europe. I think it, um, it is pretentious on the one hand, but it is also very vulnerable. And uh, I think that um, uh, um, the understanding of what uh, social values mean would be of extreme importance. And these are even more important from the point of view of national emancipation, because what is important for Georgian nation to have good education, to have good health, but precisely those nationalist neoliberal policies, they deprive Georgian nation from health, from education. So the question is, what is better nationally uh, to have uh, universally emancipatory socialist values or to have nationalist values which are simply the rhetoric of pride and self-design uh, well well it's a, it's another long conversation between it, because it's it's extremely painful for georgia but i think that uh, uh, both Georgia and Ukraine and other states probably in post soviet context are stuck between the choice West or Russia, and this is a wrong choice. I think this, and, and, and this is in, in, in pass. Uh, I think uh, there should be some kind of third way which will enable to surpass this impossible uh, dichotomy. Yeah, I think in some ways this project is attempt to try to at least slowly cohere a third way out of this sort of, at least, you know, at beginnings of it. I don't want to be too arrogant. Well, I, I see I see some some people who, who talk about it a lot. Yeah. Um, 
but maybe another conversation would be needed to discuss Georgia precisely. Yeah, I know, you know, we actually had an episode with Becca where he talks about his experiences of mentioning the word social, even. I listened to Becca's conversation. Yeah, you did. I, I, yes, I agree in many points with him. Definitely. I, uh, I, 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 I remember Georgian policies of neoliberalism coming from Kahab and Dukidze, which were discussing education and medical health and healthcare as services. And of course, this is completely anti-national politics, if, if I were to uh, define it. Um, so, um, uh, and, and it's important to understand that uh, socialist values were important for advancement of Western policies in the West. And there would be no success in the Western context in Germany or... Um, Scandinavian countries, if there had been no socialist uh, legacy, right? Uh, but I don't think Georgia, Georgian politicians discuss this. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, me personally, I did not manage to read your whole book, but I managed to read your introduction and the first chapter, and I uh, managed to watch two videos on YouTube, where you uh, used to represent your book. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, but uh, just as an introductory question for me, uh, uh, how do you understand the notion state? Because uh, the, there are different notions of the state. First, let's say uh, some antique approach to the state, like it's a common effort, which is called the state or the society, and uh, the second, like bourgeois state, which is uh, oppressive state or uh, repressive state. Uh, first of all, because uh, you know, when I read your book, uh, the state plays a big role, uh, like uh, some people um, call um, Soviet Union a capitalist state, and it is also the state, uh, and uh, this new left or Western tradition of the left, which has been developed uh, after the Second World War, they are entire state as such. And how do you understand the state? What is your uh, approach to the state? Because if you don't understand your approach, it would be quite difficult to follow your ideas. Uh, well, um, I think uh, you mentioned that the leftists call Soviet Union capitalist state, but it's the other way around. They call it state capitalism, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. This is what yes, you meant. Yes, uh, yes. yes I, I came across this idea uh, when, on the one hand, uh, Soviet Union is associated with the state logic and the state apparatus and uh, uh, and, and therefore it cannot be regarded as communist um, uh, novelty because it is a state capitalism or a state logic of distribution and management. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Soviet Union the state. I think it's the post-state uh, organization. And of course this brings... You mean up Soviet communism because... General communist or um, I, think Soviet even Union. Soviet, I think even Soviet realization of the Soviet Union it's a it's the supra state um, confederate um, um, totality so to say uh, first of all I'm against um, interpreting it in the context of state capitalism simply because um, uh, the, the profit is not expropriated as it is done in the capitalist conditions. What is um, uh, remaining from capitalist conditions is that uh, there is certain kind of accumulation, definitely, but this accumulation uh, doesn't have the logic of the surplus. Of course, we have wage labor in the Soviet context, but we don't have the uh, accumulation of surplus 
from the point of view of the proprietor. Uh, and I don't think also that the Soviet Union was the proprietor per se, uh, as in capitalist conditions. Uh, so I wouldn't call Soviet Union the state because it is, it is governed by the idea. It is not governed by the wealth of the state as such. Of course, many would um, argue with this and many would not agree with this because on the level of the geopolitical uh, cooperation and geopolitical confrontation with other states, it had to behave as a state in terms of military politics, macro politics, um, macroeconomics, uh, and also in the conditions of the Cold War, right? Uh, it had to be a supra state. But on the level of the um, production of values and on the level of the production of meanings, uh, I think that it was a post-state condition. Uh, the more so that we remember Lenin's um, state and revolution uh, in which this phase of the state or the transitory uh, condition of the state cannot be surpassed. So you have to go through mm -hmm. both dictatorship of proletariat, but at the same time, you have to go through the um, condition of the uh, state. Yeah. Although um, it's a big question whether we have to do with the national state. I don't think that we have to do with the national state uh, in these conditions, or although we have national politics and certain type of realization of national form, but it's a very specific narrative of national forms when nationality is simply the form and the contents, as you know, is not national, but it is um, ideocratic. You were talking about um, basic needs, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because basic needs, it's, it's societal um, category, I mean, because for different societies in different uh, times, the basic need, understanding of basic needs were totally different, in my opinion. How do you estimate this basic need in Soviet time? I think it brings us to this um, uh, notion of what is wealth. Uh, on the one hand, because what is wealth in capitalist conditions is not wealth in socialist conditions. And what is wealth uh, in socialist conditions becomes um, oppressive and uh, represents poverty in capitalist context. So I would say that um, basic need for me departs from the idea of, of the general a general understanding of uh, um, the common cause. Uh, and this general understanding of common cause uh, provides uh, the economy of use value. Um, so the economy of use value uh, is not simply that you are not adding uh, uh, the supplementary value um, to commodities, uh, and, and to simply exchange them and gain profit. But it is also certain kind of organization of the sociality where the general cause comes ahead of the individual cause. And uh, this is not totalitarian at all, but in the Soviet philosophy and the Soviet psychology, mm, this was even a very important a statement that all the general issues like language, um, like understanding of the common wealth, uh, they come ahead of the uh, life of the individual. Uh, and therefore, um, when you rely on these values and when they, you rely on the necessity of the general cause, or the so-called generic values, which come already from the Marxist uh, philosophic economic manuscripts of the 1844, uh, then the idea of the basic needs, basic need becomes more or less clear 
uh, it's not some kind of obligation that you impose on the society, but it's the um, decision uh, not to not to produce based on desire. So it's it's the change of the type of production. It's not deprivation of people of their um, expanded uh, economic uh, opportunities, but it's the the, the very logic uh, which um, mm, uh, simply uh, cuts off the idea of surplus and cuts off the idea of uh, luxury because it cuts off the idea of surplus enjoyment. Uh, and this is initial in the basic need and not simply like forbidding using this or that commodity. Uh, because in Soviet Union, we were used that basic need uh, is something which connects us to unhappy being because we, we, never, had, we never had more than we would desire. And, and, and I think that this was why I was talking that um, communism is unbearable is that as long as you are squeezed in this logic of desire and production based on desire and production imagining you in different phantasmatic images of yourself, then this idea of basic need is not functioning. And therefore, uh, it's important to understand that communism is not easy. Communism is not um, achievable so easily. Uh, because we are all the, the subjects that desire. And therefore, um, we should be aware that uh, the system which was forbidding this desire or which was organized that it cut off the desire, it was functioning much more productively than the human cause, which was not somehow fitting into this. So in certain sense, this ideal uh, socialist or communist cause was already systematically organized and system was more ethical than the opportunity and possibility of people and of individuals to fit it. Therefore, in capitalist condition, you are resisting the system by deviating it. You want to be more monstrous than the system. You want to transgress the system. You want to subvert the system. But in communist conditions, system already brings you this ethical, ethical cumberton, which you cannot fit. And remember the Soviet films, it's always like the, there is the common cause of communism and there, there are the individual desires and you are always following your individual desires in the beginning and then there is metanoia. You understand that your individual desires are less important than the common cause and you become a real communist by the end of the film. And um, Oleg Harhordin, in his book. Um, so he, he describes this idea of um, ethical inspection that is within uh, uh, the communist as the person who is able to self-criticize one, oneself. So it is, it is very important, this idea to not simply criticize capitalism, but to criticize one's inability to be non-capitalist. And I think this was very much present in still Althusserian critique, but then it's completely disappearing in, in the Western leftist um, theory, this um, self-censorship or self-critique. You know, it's interesting, Georgia, I su I've, I've heard this, I have never heard this anywhere else, but they call, they call Marxism the stomach's philosophy. <laughs> what do you mean stomach's philosophy? And the old, it's all about basic goods, you know, it's all about trying to eat food. Like it's like, it's a philosophy based on, they've reduced, because again, they don't understand Marxism, but like they've reduced it down to, oh, you're just like, the reason you want communism back is because you're hungry, you know, like you just want to eat and be well fed and that's all you want in life. Like somehow no, that's very all, important all, what you said, because basic need is not about having basic needs, only eating, but 
It's simply like Malevich, you know, uh, it's simply uh, surpassing this idea of eating. Basic needs um, means idealism. Basic need means uh, not precisely to be against Kharchivoy uh, princip. This is the word of Malevich, uh, who is imagining commons as people living for certain kind of ide ideas. So people who are already in some kind of clarity, clarity about the meanings of why they should live. So it's, it's much more um, comparable to some kind of uh, Dantean paradise than when people achieved uh, what is to uh, live for ideas and not be dependent on... Uh, um, on certain kind of um, urges. Uh, this is the, the word of Marx, uh, uh, the need that urges you to instigate you further. So uh, where your dependence on stomach is much more about surplus because it urges you to eat more, to gain more, to wear more, uh, to find new possibilities, new contexts, new cars. A new uh, images of yourself, whereas basic need is basic because you have other ideals, and that's what it, it is about. So in Georgia, and generally uh, in the, not in Georgia, in post-Soviet space, I, I think Marx is uh, understood as a vulgar materialist, like you know uh, that. Uh, just only um, consumption of material goods that everybody has to have uh, the, the free access to consumption of material goods and so on. They understand the economy in such way, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. But uh, it is totally different uh, what you say, and it's totally different if we read Marx more uh, precisely. Because Marx is not material, in my uh, view. Marx Absolutely. Is... Absolutely. Yes. I totally agree with you, because the main concept which I am analyzing in the last chapter belongs to Ilyenkov, and it's called the ideal. So, uh, But the ideal is not something which is a platonic ideal, which is totally torn from uh, um, the daily life, but the ideal is something that is uh, enabling us to get over um, those urges, which are precisely only vulgar material urges. And the, the main critique of Ilyenkov, his Marxist critique, is against vulgar materialism, against vulgar sociology, and uh, claiming the ideal that enables us to place our thinking, our interest, um, not in individual interests, but uh, in the other being. There is this notion of Hegel, Andersein. Nisobstvene um, bytie. So what is ideal? When you can rely on not precisely private interest, but the other determined interest. And this is commons, this is general. So to look at, at the world in general terms, use value economics uh, enables us to, to acquire this uh, universal vision, I would say. In your book, you are talking about this, not the divergence, but some kind of dichotomy between productive forces and uh, productive relation. A relation to production. Yes. yes. Um, uh, the, before you explain it, um, can you, uh, can you um, uh, say your uh, opinion about how we could converge or how it could be possible in the Soviet time uh, to convert these two uh, notions, pro not notions, but to concepts, productive forces and productive relations. Because uh, as I understood, um, uh, 
biggest, not a failure, but obstacle to um, uh, realize in Soviet Union uh, it, it, no, no, communism was this divergence between, not the divergence, but the dichotomy, because uh, in, uh, according to your words, productive forces does not fellow or fit in productive relation, which was based on non-libidinal economy. Mm -hmm. Very good question, Becca, thanks. Uh, actually, even according to Marx, uh, we have this um, uh, provision that uh, we need advanced economy, we need advanced production for realization of socialism. On the other hand, we have the paradox, and this was expressed by Vijay Prashad. Uh, Sophia, you uh, know him, and he claims that, but look, uh, history shows us that only poor countries made socialist revolutions. Why is that? There is not a single advanced and uh, promoted European or Western European country that accomplished socialist revolution. We have Cuba, we have Vietnam, uh, we have uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, uh, the Marxist idea was that the productive forces should be hijacked by the working masses, the proletarians, and then this balance between relations of productions, which is sociality and productive forces, which is technology, are organized in favor of uh, common good. But uh, what uh, uh, happened in the Soviet Union, and this is also the paradox, and I cannot explain this, and maybe this was the reason why Soviet Union came to stagnation, is that um, when you put ahead the commonwealth uh, necessity of the sociality, so you put forth the relations of production, the productive forces are lagging behind because the idea of the good is much more important than the acceleration of uh, technology. But when you don't have competition, capitalist competition, when you don't have venture capital, uh, this acceleration, for instance, of the technology in uh, um, technology of, of textures, technology of commodities, uh, technology of retail goods, which was very low in Soviet Union, only military technology was more or less uh, fitting the international standards. Uh, we have this um, um, lagging behind uh, uh, and explicit lagging behind. Uh, so uh, my question was, maybe socialism uh, inevitably uh, brings you uh, um, to this uh, another kind of misbalance, because in capitalist context, productive forces, acceleration is always going ahead. You need more development, you, you need better textures, you need um, uh, better achievements uh, in, in production, uh, whereas the sociality is, is not developing in its emancipatory uh, potentialities. And the other way around in socialist context, um, you, you have more freedoms, you, uh, the, the sociality is free, but economy is very, economic production and uh, uh, production as such is uh, very limited. Therefore, this, this, this point was not fitting the Marxist idea, also because Marx didn't talk about how to organize productively socialism. But uh, the question is, maybe capitalism is really important uh, for technological development. And we see it nowadays when we are all in capitalist context. Uh, uh, for instance, nowadays we associate uh, high technologies, digital technologies, and even cosmos with Elon Musk and not this idea of um, a conquest of cosmos for, for the reason of the humanity, but we have completely different logics. So 
Um, also, just to note, and I, but I didn't research this idea, the letters of Marx to Vera Zasulic, where they discuss that maybe the poverty of the country and this um, inherent commons, which was characteristic to, for instance, Russian peasantry uh, or Russian proletarian movement is really important for, um, for the idea of uh, the proletarian revolution, which, which never happened in the, in the West, actually, despite the fact that, for instance, Negri and Hart, you know, his, um, his idea of uh, the immaterial labor uh, to produce new proletarian subject to find immaterial laborers, and they will be new proletarians, but they didn't work because the subjugation is somewhere else. So the main idea with the revolution was that we are delegating the uh, capacity to be an enlightened subject to absolutely non-enlightened subject. So this is what happened in Russian revolution, why it was so effective that the middle class and the bourgeoisie all of a sudden, uh, having acquired the position of enlightenment and the position of um, sophistication all of a sudden says, no, we are not the subject of emancipation. These people will be the subject of emancipation. They will be philosophic subjects and they will be the subjects of enlightenment, although they are not able to be subjects of enlightenment. So I think this effectuated the uh, this almost fanta fantastic condition that the proletarian becomes the historical subject. Otherwise, this would not be possible because nowadays uh, the so-called cultural left are talking about emancipation, emancipation, but there is a huge split between subjugation and the discourse of those who talk about emancipation. Why? Because it, it's very difficult to read Marx. It's very difficult to read texts about emancipation. It's very difficult to talk and understand what emancipation is for those layers which are totally subjugated. And I think that the contemporary left did not solve this problem. And you can see that it, it has not been solved. What should be have been done in uh, Soviet Union to uh, close this gap between productive forces and uh, productive relations? Well, it's a very difficult question. And I think I cannot answer this question. I can only make some kind of references. Well, first of all, uh, there was a big deba debate about cybernetics and technology in Soviet 60s and 70s, uh, because there was this idea that if cybernetic comes, that the systemic approach will help to organize uh, the Soviet context in a better way, and this optimization of technology will enable the whole system to function better. But, but this didn't work. Actually, in the end, the cybernetic tools were used only for gas. Uh, for instance, Glushkov worked for the system and infrastructure of gas. Uh, and the supply uh, of gas for the whole Soviet system. And, and, and this really functioned. But in terms of uh, guaranteeing that ideology works systemically by means of cybernetics, this, this, this never happened. Uh, because I think desire is stronger than the technological uh, optimization. Um, so I would agree much more with the fact that uh, probably um, what was ruining uh, uh, was the shadow economy. Uh, I think this uh, double thought and double life, because this double life was, uh, uh, was killing all the ideas uh, that functioned in the sphere of this common good and how to use technology for the better, etc. So um, I think shadow economy uh, was always bringing uh, different goals. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, this idea when the left say that, well, Soviet Union was ruined because it didn't have developed productive forces, 
uh, now look at the West. They have developed productive forces and they have developed technology. They have extremely developed ideas of artificial intelligence, cybernetics. Uh, there is a very interesting book by Aaron Bastani, if you know, um, uh, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, where he talks uh, uh, about the possibility for technological uh, expansion and he claims that as soon as we, we shall have technical access uh, to all the developments, we might have we will surpass scarcity. So what is the problem of impossibility of communism? It is scarcity. Uh, so as long as we have developed technology, people will be satisfied all over the world. They, there will be no shortages, uh, etc. But uh, the, the communism is not about uh, uh, surpassing scarcity. It's, it's about um, uh, precisely the urge uh, and the images of luxury. So technology will not help you to get rid of the images of luxury and uh, uh, the images of your success, because these images of success, which we have now in uh, um, social networks, like it's, it's the same surplus value. Uh, it's the same symbolic capital, which nourishes the, uh, this idea of, of the self and the self-interest. So I, I don't know how to answer this question, what, what had to be done then, but it is clear that um, Ilyenkov's idea, for instance, was that technology should be governed uh, by philosophy. And the technicists uh, were against uh, this philosophic totality uh, philosophic state, and they were for uh, cybernetic values and more, mm, more systemic values, S system that works on its own, um, on its own uh, 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 across the sociality. So uh, this, this this didn't happen in the Soviet Union, although there there were people who believed in this uh, systemic approach. But to go back to desire, uh, I think one of the, the main driving forces for the shadow economy was really also you know, the West was directly propagandizing this, like we have all these commodities that you do not have, you know, of course, the most Marlboro cigarettes and jeans being the sort of more famous examples. But uh, like if this, uh, I think, you know, um, well-constructed um, effort to make people in the Soviet Union feel like they were missing out, that they were, that there was all this wonderful things happening in the West, like they had everything and plus more than the Soviet <laughs> Union did, right? Um, and including even like propagation of literature and culture from the West that was showing their like big houses and like fancy dresses and whatever. Um, if that, like, well, I would say how Big of a role did that play? Because I think that's a huge part um, why there was a shadow economy, why there was this constant. Um, well, actually, not with everybody. I think it's the elites. A lot of I would say the, it worked more with the elites. You know, in Georgian elites, for example, are much more like I was told from when I was a kid. Oh, you know, like you know, to get these like commodities like Barbie doll, which we didn't have, you know, was considered like I was the coolest person in the world because my mother got me a Barbie at, at like eight, you know, in a dollar store. So like um, this was definitely, you know, they, they my, my family itself in, instilled these values from when I was young that somehow, you know, foreign goods were better and then I was special for having access to them, right? Yeah. Um, and also at the same time with the Reagan economics of like sort of this, the, the race with them, you know, so you know, being forced to spend more and more in military further led to decrease in sort of commodity production. And then this constant at the same time, you know, ongoing propaganda, you know, created this, um, you know, shadow economy and this like lack, you know, lack.
The idea of the leg, I totally yeah. agree because uh, why there was Iron Curtain? Iron Curtain was the, was not the outcome of West and East confrontation at all. This was not a geopolitical problem, but this was precisely the problem of visibility of capitalist riches. Because, I mean, uh, also we should understand that uh, there is this unconscious desire of capitalism. It's not that we want capitalism, but it's that we unconsciously desire certain images of living, which happen to be capitalist and which we cannot get rid of. So therefore, it was very important uh, for me to observe this intrinsic capitalism despite non-capitalist rhetoric. This is one thing. Uh, another thing is that uh, of course, when you see the idea of prosperity and when you see the elements of prosperity, uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, consent with the uh, images of poverty. But on the other hand, um, uh, uh, do you remember, for instance, if you remember the context of Soviet sociality, uh, that... Um, uh, this ideal state when when you have culture when you have meaning and the material values are less important uh, this is normality and then uh, some kind of sublime meaning of commodity have takes place in in the shadow economy so elementary commodity in soviet union acquired this um, status of sublimity, of some kind of sublime, uh, high-flown desire. Whereas the ideocracy and the ideocratic constant daily life was a normality. Uh, uh, so it, it turns uh, the other way around in capitalist context uh, uh, because uh, the commodity is your uh, daily life. Um, and its fetishism is unconscious. For instance, I mean, in daily life in capitalist context, you will not be dreaming about jeans or you will not be dreaming about Barbie. It just goes without saying. Uh, but... Uh, uh, what will be the sublimity uh, will be some kind of idea, some kind of ideal, some kind of uh, sublime matters. I think uh, that this uh, goes the other way around. It would be really very important to analyze precisely shadow economy, which I have not done, and which would, which would be probably another another goal of analysis and of economic analysis, because I would add one uh, aspect. I asked one economist who was researching socialist economy precisely, I asked him why they couldn't do more attractive things, like uh, where they doing it deliberately that it looked so ugly and unimaginable to wear. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, was it precisely for the sake of making it extremely unattractive so that people are forced to be so frugal and so modest? And he said, no, this was not done deliberately. This was just some kind of approach to distributive economy. And then it worked that way. And then uh, there were several meetings even at the end of 70s about some kind of re reconstruction of economy in favor of uh, better goods, but they failed to do it until the perestroika came and they organized already certain kinds of cooperation and cooperatives which allowed a profit. So it's, it's a very mystical thing that with the absence of the idea of profit, this attraction disappears somehow from the, from the, um, from the logic of production as such. Which, um, interesting enough, um, my brother was almost killed for Ray-Ban sunglasses <laughs> when they were first came in, in in the early early 90s, like the first 1990 1991. 
uh, because someone took his sunglasses and then never returned it. And they had like, he was wounded, like physically, like he was shot um, mm. during also because there was, you know, decentralization and young kids had, had weapons and held these neighborhood like wars. But it was over sunglasses because my brother was like showing off his Ray-Ban, you know, sunglasses and some other kid wanted it because it was this mystical thing. Um, but um, what the, inter you know, interesting thing is like, you know, now what, I mean, I grew up in the United States um, and I've Tell only, by your accent. Yeah. <laughs> and I've only recently moved back in the past six years in Georgia, but like growing up without, you know, without a home, you know, praying for rent my whole life having no health care, you know, and so on. And always like afraid if I lose my job, I will no longer have a home or food. Um, even though there is like this, the idea of like commodities, right. becomes like super secondary, right. Because it's every day. Like, yeah. But they never had that. So I argue with my aunt all the time and I'm like, you are 83 years old. You have never had a need you couldn't fulfill. You've always had a home. You've always had a health care. I've always had these things that I can only dream about. Like when I was dreaming about Barbie, you know, eight, because they told me it was better, even though I always liked my, you know, other dolls better. You know, now I'm dreaming about a home <laughs> where I don't have to pay rent. Like that's the ultimate luxury to me. So I think this idea, like this trade-off that people weren't assuming, in a way they had the best of both worlds. I mean, I, th I feel like Georgia had really the best, right? In the 70s was probably like, the best time here you had the shadow economy but everything the Soviet Union gave you and you were doing really really well so like the idea of that if you this if you stopped if the Soviet Union collapsed you may be able to get the Barbie but then you could no longer have all these other things that you had like access to culture you know opera to films to you know um whatever millions of other things like houses healthcare and so on And so that was a huge trade-off that was was never ever explained, right? It was like almost like um, I don't know how to say, it, but like people were kept um, kind of like childlike. You know, the Soviet Union person was very naive. Absolutely, absolutely. They were naive, and uh, um, uh, uh, I, I totally agree with you because I grew up in radically anti-Soviet family. My parents were uh, absolutely anti-Soviet and I wouldn't even imagine when I was a child that I would be researching anything about Marx. So this would be a, a shame for me when I lived in Georgia and even when I came uh, to study at the university. So this happened much later when I tried to understand a certain logic of how it functioned. Uh, and uh, what you call is, is precisely the values of the Commonwealth, which should be shared by anyone. They go without saying. Uh, and definitely we have the trash glamour of cheap commodities. You can have your cheap uh, Barbies and clothes, etc. You can have even your iPhone somewhere in Lebanon uh, in your slum. Uh, where, where you are just standing at the counter and selling something and, and having no hope that you or your uh, children will ever have education. But nevertheless, you are uh, somehow within this capitalist um, uh, dream about uh, prosperity. It's absolutely illusionary dream. And this is precisely what is converted forms the form that Marx talks about and that then Mamardashvili discusses because you see the world in completely shifted way. Why? Because instead of claiming that you are proletarian who needs emancipation, you think that it's only you, you are potentially a millionaire. Just now you are poor. So th this is completely different logic, which doesn't enable you to subjectivize as the subjugated or suppressed uh, subject who claims um, new knowledge and new logic uh, rather than uh, be in the expectation of certain kind of luxury that you will get at some point. If you get million likes on YouTube or if you get, uh, I don't know, Uh, success uh, somewhere in show business or in any other business.
Yes, uh, totally agree with you. Um, uh, just. Uh, the, the, as uh, you mentioned, it somehow the Iron Curtain was something like advertisement. So how the advertisement works today in capitalist society, it was the Iron Curtain, as I understood, for the uh, Soviet society. Like you know, behind it is a uh, better commodity or something like that. Like advertisement shows your everything, everyday life, etc. There exists a better commodity and we have to buy it. But it has, of course, it has something to do with the uh, consumer society, which is criticized, criticized a lot. And uh, I agree with criticism just uh, when I see the modern uh, society in Georgia, modern, it in, not in the sense of modernization, but current society in Georgia. Um, I, can, I can remember, for example, that um, uh, when somebody uh, went to uh, went to his, their friends or something like this, they took every time uh, the champagne, the Soviet champagne, and this chocolate bambaneta. It was mm. called bambaneta, and uh, it was something like status symbol, you know. And this status symbol transformed himself also in the. Um, uh, the, the, in the modern time, after the collapse of Soviet Union, somehow the aces to this status symbol made the people uh, the mm, consumption yeah. of commodity uh, was the, the way to make yourself, not the dedication to the society. You know what I mean? Current is a current situation. For example, a um, lot of young people which are brainwashed already with the educational system what we have in Georgia, uh, which uh, attach success with a consumption, not success with a dedication to his own society or the country and so on. It works very nice. It works very even nice. because though, uh, uh, Even not only society, but enlightenment. This is very important, just knowledge. I mean, cog cognitive values. Uh, a certain kind of enlightening values. And you are very right, but um, my friend Samo Tomsic, he has a very good book, which he wrote in 2015, I think it's called Capitalist Unconscious. And he shows there that consumption uh, substitutes culture. So nowadays it's much more awful not to consume with proper thing with proper elements it's more important to know how to consume how to organize your living how to make interiors how to design your looks so this is about knowledge and this is about culture rather than uh, certain understanding of what happened in history or what happened in in the history of uh, i don't know knowledge or or culture or, or, or politics. So this is also becoming, consumption is becoming cultural and cognitive. It is also about skills of cognition uh, and technology is added here because look at technology, how we use technology. Do we know something about the meaning of technology? Well, maybe only intellectuals, but generally technology is used as some kind of new apps on your iPhone, or even Silicon Valley is developing those new apps. So even Silicon Valley is dedicated so much to new consumption. And even the ideas of Elon Musk about cosmos, they are also about some kind of uh, fascinating illusions or certain kind of uh, elitist consumption, maybe. Um, it was clear that uh, in the middle of 60s, the Western society was becoming post-industrial. And this was a radical breakthrough. And, you know, the achievements of mobilization that were achieved in the beginning of the Soviet Union, they were becoming slower and slower. So there was the necessity of another leap, of another achievement, which was very difficult to do without this idea of mobilization, of uh, struggling and fighting with capitalism, etc. So what capitalism was showing that it's uh, 
technical opportunities are bigger. So, uh, so it, it was the confirmation of the fact that the capital is functioning more efficiently and more productively because it is ahead. It is ahead technically. It is ahead in terms of technologies. It is ahead in terms of skills. Uh, and this transformation from industrial labor to post-industrial was very painful for, for the Soviet context because the whole mythology was based on industrial proletarian model. Uh, so how to make the hero out of the post-industrial non-proletarian um, worker? Uh, this was also the problem. Uh, and uh, another thing was um, who will be uh, ideologically in charge of, of this technological uh, breakthrough. So I, I think the Politburo understood and there were lots of efforts to bring the, the technical modification into the system, but they could not decide uh, what philosophy should govern it because they didn't know how to put Marxist philosophy over technological development. Why? Because cybernetics in its ethics is not Marxist. You know why? Uh, because um, uh, cybernetics is not dialectical. Cybernetics is connecting biology and sociality together. So uh, there, was, there were some ethical incompatibilities within it. And I think they simply couldn't decide it. For instance, the, this you can see in Ilyenkov's critique of cybernetics and artificial intelligence, where he's claiming that, yes, we need technology, technology should develop, but we should not allow that cybernetics will occupy the chair of the director of philosophy institute. Because this was already happening. This was already happening in the 60s that people from cybernetic were claiming that we are philosophers. We don't need Marx anymore. Marx can function as a philosophic uh, horizontality organizing the system without this ideological hardware, you know? Uh, so they couldn't make decision between hard and soft. And uh, I, I think that they could not somehow provide this disposition of how to organize ideological government, Marxist government of technical development. Maybe if they managed this, and uh, actually Ilyenkov was suggesting how to organize it, maybe uh, the, uh, this would be possible. But also we have to have in mind that the decomposition of the socialist project comes from above. Uh, this is the idea of Boris Groys. Uh, it doesn't come from um, inability of the masses. Masses were used to this poverty. Masses were used to the frugality. Uh, and well, shadow economy existed, but I think um, the idea to finish it com comes from above, uh, but also um, it was an abrupt decision. And, and you know this from Perestroika. The, I think this decision happened one, uh, uh, one in, in certain circles. Uh, and uh, uh, otherwise, uh, the sustainability of socialism was greater than we can imagine now, I think. So the last question, which, uh, as I mentioned already, it has not not a lot to do with the Soviet Union and the past. It's about the future, uh, about use value and exchange value, because I understand this problem in the in this context, uh, and about basic income, not the basic need. Um, you know, uh, you was talking about um, digitalization, like techni technical advancement, digitalization, robotization, and the uh, whole world and whole political economies nowadays are talking about it. And there are some uh, there are some ideas that after the digitalization, after um, uh, the robotization, when the people will lose the jobs in some countries at least, not everywhere, because 
you know, everywhere has a lot of to do to achieve this stage of development when the, everything is digitalized or everything is robotized. But uh, in some part of the world, they will leave, uh, lose their jobs. And um, after that, one solution would be the basic income mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. uh, not the basic income is a uh, part of uh, the, the, in this, um, I would say, uh, uh, particular Marxian approach that everybody would have the basic income to um, follow their um, cognitive needs and uh, uh, hobbies and so on, but basic income is an income, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, provide everybody with a basic income, with, with the people which will lose uh, their jobs. But in the both ways, the basic income, how do you understand, you know, because um, uh, we live in the society at the moment or in the economy, in global economy, when uh, everything pro is produced uh, not for use value, but for exchange value. And if we take the commodities, they have uh, the, the no use value anymore because we have some smartphone, for example, which is, uh, uh, which is dated with uh, 2020. And uh, uh, in the next year, we have the same smartphone with just small, change which is dated with 2021 and uh, it has no, uh, no use value anymore for me it is it has such exchange value and the further production as i see it as i can imagine uh, and further commodities will have only the exchange value no use value and in my opinion we will uh, we will achieve the point well, even with um, aggressive advertisement and so on, we will achieve the point where nobody will, nobody will buy it anymore. Because first, the people will not have the enough income because a lot of people will lose their jobs. And the second, what is more important for me, it would, it would not have the uh, use value anymore. And my question is, how do you... Um, generally, uh, uh, with a consideration of this uh, development, what would be not the reason, but uh, function of uh, uh, basic income? Because you know, generally, in the, uh, um, if we talk about income, income is just to uh, reproduce yourself. Everybody for his uh, uh, work, it does not mean it is work for salary or it is generally work, needs some valuation. 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 And it, 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 it's called reward. You, you reward, can... exactly. The word reward. And if a lot of people will uh, depend on these basic needs, despite of quantity of basic needs. Maybe this basic need will more as generally what uh, the people uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the needs for their social and uh, physical reproduction. Maybe more, but uh, this basic need will not be, will not have the function of rewarding what is very necessary because some people think that after basic needs, the people will have the, uh, the, the possibility uh, to um, follow their hobbies and so on, and they will, uh, will be very happy because before they had no this choice because a uh, whole time they spent on the work. But if the people has no work, if the people have no reward, and they have the basic, just the basic income, Mm -hmm. which is social assistance, nothing else. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. The, the people, the humans, as a human being, the people will lose their... Their function. Their function, generally. Because for every, every work, every act, everybody, it, it does not mean it is for salary or it does not mean it is for hobby. 
They need the reward for, for the hobby, for example. It is uh, like your uh, product of your hobby will become public if somebody is uh, applauding you. For work, it is a salary, you know? But after this, after this basic income, the people will lose their function as a human, in my opinion. How yes. do you see it? Uh, it, it's very important that it has several um, aspects. Well, first aspect is that the history of how basic income originated. Well, you you were several times mixing basic need and basic income. I think no, I'm not mixing. I just separated it not to use this basic need generally. Yeah. And that's why I, I added the word quantitatively. Yes. Uh, well, it originated in uh, post-operaist discourse with uh, uh, Paolo Virno, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, for them, labor could be only exploitation. So in the conditions when you work a lot and you are under remunerated, the idea was that we do not get any access to riches. So at least give us basic income. And since labor is only um, dead abstract labor, uh, such labor in which you are killing your personality, then labor is only negative. Therefore, basic income is helping you to somehow not to work. And post operaista was the movement not to work. So this is kind of a very, a little bit counter Marxist because for Marx, labor can be emancipatory as well. Exactly, exactly. But uh, again, when we come to these uh, uh, different ideas of emancipation in Soviet context, for instance, labor is emancipatory. In a radical post-structuralist leftist context, it is not. Therefore, the idea of basic income is that we do whatever we want. We are the free um, citizens and give us basic income and you earn money as much as you want. But um, uh, uh, basic income is not solving the problem of financial capital. So uh, this 99% who have to work will get the basic income, but the surplus wealth that exists with uh, Bezos, uh, Google, uh, Elon Musk, uh, and uh, mega corporations, it will always belong to them. So it is even productive for those mega companies to distribute a little bit of basic income with the citizens. And um, uh, also, uh, the idea of basic income was very much discussed after pandemic, when people were not able to work. Uh, and interestingly, nobody discussed basic need, like, let's finish producing things that we do not need. But everyone discussed the idea of basic income. So, um, uh, uh, one of the third aspects is that... Um, certain uh, economies that look on uh, digital economies and the um, uh, network economies, like social network economies, Facebook, Google, uh, uh, Telegram, and, and those uh, tycoons and owners of the corporation, which became multi-multi-billionaires, they discuss basic income as some sort of distribution, like I, I, as the user of Facebook, can get 1% from uh, Zuckerman or from, uh, as the user of Google, also 1%. So let's get a little bit more as the users. This was the discussion of basic income also in the context of this financial um, immaterial uh, production. But I think this, this, this is not really leading to anywhere because it is not sequestering or criticizing in any way financial capital and it keeps the mega profit of the financial capital. But at the same time, it doesn't give me emancipation to realize myself as the subject, uh, as the creative subject to get remuneration and reward uh, in... Uh, in my invention, in my creativity, right? So I completely agree with you that it doesn't have the creative potential, but as well the economic potential. And basic need is a little bit different because basic need is, 
is, for instance, would be like in Soviet Union, uh, you remember we were discussing, like even if you are a star, you don't, give, uh, you don't get the salary of the star. You, you get some moderate salary because it's not ethical to get the salary of the star because if you are better than the other, you are contributing to the betterness of the world. And uh, this yeah. belongs to common good. I mean, uh, uh, whereas uh, if you are the star, for instance, I don't know, Brad Pitt, you get uh, much more than another talented actor somewhere in the small theater. And then he becomes a tycoon and this actor is a nobody. So you see that this logic of basic need uh, works a little bit differently than basic income. It's about um, common values in understanding of your achievement rather exactly. than rather than distribution of surplus like, like give me also a little bit one percent so it's not about squeezing somebody's income but rather about uh, mm, uh, uh, common ethics of uh, basics in favor of commons i would say so <laughs> uh, <Okay>. yeah <laughs> great great thank you um, we're probably going to take the last part off when we record, though, because it's a lot. But it's actually interesting because they always say that, you know, like, you know, say doctors do not get enough money in Georgia or whatever Soviet Union. And so the other respect that you got was, you know, made, made up for the wages that weren't there, you know, like a little bit of, you know, respect and some privileges. And they always say, like, that wasn't enough, you know, because, because of course, doctors wanted to have tons you know make millions like they do in the u.s or something but in reality you know in the u.s in the south they used you know du bois he calls i think he called it white wages mm. but like the segregation when they forced even though white people made the same or less than black people or about the same you know poor whites the fact that blacks you know black people had to like take off the hat to say hello or whatever was a made, made up for their lack of wages as part mm -hmm. of sort of white supremacy, you know, like that continued them feeling like we're part of the white, um, you know, white people dominant group against the black. So it's interesting how it's very effective in the U.S. context. This like not wages, but this like privilege, uh, you know, through segregation, while so-called not apparently not good enough in the Soviet Union context of a different kind of wages. That's, I yeah, think, I, also I incorrect. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Uh, uh, I understand what you mean because, uh, for instance, the Soviet Union was always blamed in having wage labor. It means that you are a hired worker, but wage waged labor was not the wages in terms of capitalist context yes. because... Um, it was not so much uh, basic income because everybody had the same, but it was uh, some some kind of uh, um, consent for distributive logic in favor of everyone. Because you, you cannot have uh, 10 villas if someone is having no place for living. Right. Uh, and uh, the question is whether you would deprive yourself from... Uh, another house uh, if you were to know that somebody is suffering. So this logic of investing into the commons, uh, it doesn't work nowadays unless you have some sort of kind of civil society. But uh, nowadays we, I mean, we, we are losing this, even this opportunity of civil society. Uh, because civil society was the remainder of the socialist democracy. And since we have less and less socialist democracy, then even this is probably more absent. <laughs> Moments